Past paper questions then. Let's start with this nice cryptography question. Cryptography uses asymmetric or symmetric encryption methods. Symmetric encryption methods use a single key, which encrypts and decrypts data. Asymmetric encryption methods use a public key for encryption and a private key for data decryption. Part A. Describe the advantages of asymmetric encryption and the advantages of symmetric encryption. Four marks is are four clear points we need from this. The mark scheme clearly says we have a mark per point and will allow us to say the reverse argument. So for instance, if we said asymmetric was slower to encrypt, we'd get the mark if the mark scheme said symmetric is faster to encrypt, but we wouldn't get the mark for both of them. So let's start with asymmetric. Anyone can have access to the encryption key. It's a public key. The decryption key is the only thing that has to be kept safe. So that's a massive advantage. Not everyone has to have access to the key that encrypts and decrypts, which is nice. So the decryption key can be kept just for the people that need to read the messages and the encryption key can be given out freely to everyone else. It's more secure than symmetric because we aren't able to go backwards from the key we have to encrypt to decrypt. And it's probably most suitable for online transactions. Without public key cryptography, without asymmetric encryption, online transactions wouldn't really be a thing. How about symmetric then? Well, first of all, there are fewer keys to generate. You have one key and that goes back and forth. They're easier to generate as well. They're going to have simpler complexity. It's going to be faster to encrypt, so it's computationally simpler. And the longer the key, the more secure the algorithm. So we'll have a look at a key in the next question. But if the key is long, the algorithm becomes more secure because it takes longer to break. However, it is most suitable for encrypting stuff on your own computer. And both the sender and receiver must know the key. I love this question. The Boolean XOR is often used in cryptography. You remember XOR from the AS units. It's an exclusive OR. Both bits that are used as inputs to an XOR need to be differently set in order for us to get a 1 as the result. We've got some ASCII representations of OK and an exclamation mark, and we've got a key. What we need to do is use XOR to encrypt the string. This is reasonably easy. We start off here by placing our value for O and our key on top of each other. And then it's just a case of going down column by column and using an XOR on it. So our first column XOR produces 1 because they're different. Our second column XOR produces 0 because they're the same. Then we've got a difference, so it's a 1, a difference, so it's a 1, a difference, a difference, and then the last two are the same, so we're going to get zeros out of it. That's our ciphertext, that's our encrypted data. So let's move on to the K and do that exact same thing. We're starting off with two different values, we get a 1. Identical values, we get a 0. Different 1, different 1. Different, we still get a 1. Identical values, a 0. Identical values, and identical values again. So you can see how easy this is to do, actually. It's reasonably simplistic. Final one, the exclamation mark, we have different values, so we get a 1. Different values, get a 1. Identical values, we get a 0. Different values, we get a 1. Then we've got two identical values in a row there, so we get zeros. A different value, a 1, and identical values, a 0. And you can see from the mark scheme there that those marks are all consistent, but you get a mark per letter. So it's quite a reasonably simplistic and mechanical thing to do that gives you all the marks you need. Part C, describe two deficiencies of the key. All right, well, this is interesting. So we get two marks for any of these options. The first one is the key short. It's an 8-bit key. We could crack that in a few minutes with a reasonably powerful computer system. It can't be publicly shared. The moment you share that key for encryption, the person can just work backwards to decrypt it. So you can't publicly share that encryption key at all. The third thing is XOR encryption is extremely common. It's going to be one of the first things you try if you're trying to brute force your way and work out what this encrypted data actually is. It's also very short. 8 bits would be difficult to use on a 64-bit machine. If the word length is greater than 8 bits, we are going to struggle to use this key to encrypt our data. Question 10 then, some questions on malicious software here. Part A, 
Describe the type of malicious software which might be transferred to computers and the delivery mechanisms and the steps that can be taken to protect against these. So, one mark for each of the following up to a maximum of three for the descriptions and then the other three will be elsewhere. So, indicative content, that always means this is an idea of what you can say but there would be other options. But the classic ones are always viruses and they go on to say viruses are programs that can replicate themselves and be spread from one system to another and they're used to modify or corrupt information. Worms, self-replicating again, but the point of them is to enable remote control. Spyware, it's installed often by opening attachments or downloading infected software and what it does, it collects user data without their, without their knowledge or consent and transmits it over the internet to somebody else. A Trojan, think about this as a Trojan horse from the, from the classic story. A Trojan's a program that looks useful, uh, but when you actually install it and run it, it provides a backdoor that enables data to be stolen or could be a, a transmission vector for other types of malicious software. Now, how do we protect against it? Well, virus and spyware, checking software needs to be kept, kept up to date, so that's your antivirus software. A firewall could be used to prevent against an authorized access and the way that works is it stops random computers connecting to yours unless they know the exact port number. Email attachments should not be opened unless from a trusted source. Uh, that's pretty much a gimme, isn't it, nowadays, although people still do. And users need to be cautious of fraudulent emails. Some phishing emails, that's phishing with a PH, look so realistic that people click on them and put their password in without thinking. Of course, there needs to be a hierarchy of passwords, in other words, the admin password is more important than everyone else's and that my password might not give me access to the entire system, which is the same as access levels there. And user policies saying that I must or mustn't do certain things might help. Part B, computer data may be at its highest security risk during transfer from one location to another. Outline the risks that exist at this time and how they can be minimized. Okay, so let's have a think about it. We got one mark for each risk and one mark for the minimization of the following up to a maximum of four. If you've got part one, you need to expand on it with part two of the minimization. The first one they've got is data might be intercepted. Well, of course it will. Data will be intercepted by people along the chain because that's how the internet works. Data is passed from node to node to node. If one of those nodes is a bad actor of somebody trying to read your data, they can, of course, read it. So that means sensitive data should be encrypted when sent along the internet. Data is particularly at risk at a public Wi-Fi location. Now, why is that? Because if you're all on the same public Wi-Fi, all the data is being bounced around from computer to computer to computer on a much larger scale than if it was a wired network. Therefore, you should be using password protection. Now, the last point is extremely retro, but let's go with it. Data sent by post, like on a USB memory stick and put in the mail, might be intercepted. All right, fine, granddad, that's, I'm sure it will. The storage medium should be password protected. Sensitive data should be encrypted. Okay, I, I'll be honest with you. I would do the first two in this question. The third one makes me feel like a 70-year-old man or something trying to explain how you might post a USB stick in the mail. But there you go, they're your options. Now, here's a nice one. They like the biometrics for the reasonably lengthy essay-style question at the back of the paper. This is an 11 marker. These essay-style questions are marked on bands. Now, I'm, I'm a, I'll be 100% honest with you all. The number one reason that my students fall down when answering these past paper questions is that they just dump the contents of their brains onto the paper and don't really think about writing it in a way that expands an argument or that looks even remotely like an essay. Now, I'm not saying here that you need to write a 3,000 word beautifully crafted argument as to why one thing is better than another here. No, what you need to do is make sure you hit the criteria for getting in that 9 to 11 mark band. So, what do you need to do? You write an extended response with a sustained line of reasoning which is coherent, relevant, and logically structured. So plan it out. Make sure you're not just jumping from point to point to point. This is the last question in your paper. So take the time to plan it out as you would plan out a proper essay. Where's the introduction? Where are your key points going to be? How can they flow in a nice way? How can you conclude it at the end? 
The second point here, show clear understanding of the requirements of the, of the question and a clear knowledge of the topics, okay? So that means we need to hit the indicative content marks, we need to know what we're talking about and express them clearly, technically, and with relevance to the question. We can't just bring things up that don't have relevance to the question. This should be minimal repetition, and this is where bullet points, full sentencing for your answers and planning this out helps, because it is very easy if you're just pouring the contents of your brain into a paragraph format answer to repeat yourself time and time again. I have lost track of the amount of times I've been marking these essay questions, and people have made a point in the second paragraph that they've repeated in the third and fifth. And you don't get any more marks for repeating yourself. In fact, repeating yourself brings you down in the bandings. You, pre you should present a balanced argument. So you're going to justify your arguments and explain why. There's going to be because and reasons that are realistic. And you're going to try and bring together different areas of knowledge, skills and understanding. So you're not just going to dump everything about biometrics in here. You might drop a few bits and pieces from elsewhere. And of course, appropriate technical terminology. Now, I'm not going to go through the rest of the, of the banding there, but you can see how they're breaking down. You drop from 9 to 11 to 4 to 8 just by having an adequate understanding and an adequate line of reasoning. It should be an extended response. It's an essay question. You're going to bash out about a page worth of writing here that's thoughtful and thought out. Now, if you just dump the contents of your brain onto a page, you're going to end up in the one to three mark category. Just a bunch of things written down, no well-developed arguments, poor justification. If you don't use your technical terminology, you're going to end up down there. And then there's the shame-worthy zero marks, which happens sometimes. Now, mainly it happens when people don't understand the question, can't answer it, or run out of time as they get to the end of a paper. But getting zero marks for this question when it's a nice open-ended question, is something you should be avoiding at all costs. So what is the question? Well, here we are. Khan's Pharmaceuticals currently uses an ID card system to control employee access to its premises. Okay. This has proved problematic with employees swapping cards and the company now wishes to use a voice print recognition system in its place. Oh, interesting. Describe how this system would operate and explain the benefits and drawbacks, drawbacks associated with the biometric system used for this purpose. Now you might be thinking, voice print recognition? Well, this gives you a very obvious way to overlap with one of the other units. Now, there is a previous unit that talks about voice assistance and voice print recognition. So combining that with biometrics lets you talk about two different units very, very simply and quickly here and show your knowledge of the vast contents of the computer science specification. Let's take a look at this indicative content. What sort of points are they expecting you to bring up? Well, they're expecting you to talk about the fact that the voice print of each employee will be recorded when they join the company. That's very similar to the way our activity was broken down, isn't it? It's stored in a secure format, probably encrypted. And when you attempt to enter the building, the original voice print is compared to the current voice print of the employee. If it's match, they're allowed in. A number of attempts are allowed. This is all pretty standard of biometrics. But let's go on to the benefits. So first of all, it's more secure. It's going to be difficult to replicate the data or the unique voice print. Now, I'm just going to stop us here a minute because that's in the mark scheme. Every time I've done this question as a past paper question, at least one person in my class has put their hand up and gone, hold on, sir, what if I record somebody's voice and just play it back? I would see that as a significant security problem. Now, you'd have to hope that the way these systems would work is they'd ask you to read out a certain phrase. And it wouldn't just be the same sentence repeated time after time. So put that idea to one side a minute and we'll continue with looking at the mark scheme. So you can't lose your voice, <laughs> although you can, can't you? Uh, but you can't misplace your voice, you can't have it stolen, and you can't forget to bring it with you. You can't be fished or tricked out of your voice. Uh, but again, though, you could be asked to repeat a simple phrase, couldn't you? And somebody could record it, but there you go. Uh, you can speed up cues at the entrance or exit if it's all going well, but there are problems, so it's not always reliable. Now, you all know from using your smart assistants that if it's even a little bit noisy, they get confused. I know that during all this remote learning we've been doing recently, I've been setting multiple people's Alexas off all the time, 
And just a few lessons ago, one of my students, Alexis, was reading out the history of the band ABBA because it misunderstood something I said as I was talking to them. So if there's even a bit of background noise, it can get confused. People's voices change over time as well. As you age, your voice changes. And presumably, and presumably then what you'd need to do is update your voice print match regularly to make sure that it was always current. There are, of course, privacy concerns because your voice print is being stored and it is going to be expensive to set up. I'd say another drawback that's not mentioned here is that what happens if I get a cold or if I'm ill and, my, and I find it difficult to speak? Is that going to allow my voice print to match up? There are, uh, there's a bunch of indicative content there and pretty much that phrase indicative content gives you almost carte blanche to write something sensible and relevant that you think is worthwhile as long as you structure it properly and using the banding system to get yourself into that top band. This is a lovely question to write about and to show off your knowledge of computer science and thinking about the real impact of it in the real world. It is a brilliant question, but you must approach it like it's an essay question in an exam.